Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for our next installment of our Red Hen Press Reading and Conversation Series. I'm Monica Fernandez. And I'm Toby Harper. And we're incredibly excited to bring this conversation to you this evening. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which Toby, Kate, and I are broadcasting from is the, un is the occupied and seized territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva and Keech people. As safety protocols allow, and at your comfort levels, if you find yourself taking trips around LA, we encourage you to visit some of the many historical landmarks that mark the presence and history of these tribes. Places like the Tong Tongva Peak in Glendale, Coenga Peak in Hollywood, which is just behind the Hollywood sign, and Tongva Park in Santa Monica are just a few places to explore. When it's safe to do so, I definitely intend on taking a day trip around LA to educate myself on the indigenous history of all of these landmarks. If you're curious, here is a list of local LA based and Tonga landmarks. Maybe there's something near you. To introduce our event tonight, please welcome managing editor and co-founder of Red Hen Press, Kate Gale. Hello, Kate. Good to see you both. All right, looking forward mm -hmm. to hearing about Afa and getting these uh, readings. Yeah, thanks Kate, take it away. Right. So we're starting tonight's event with the amazing Afa Weaver. We've been looking at the way formalism works in American poetry. And tonight we might be looking at the ways that formalism is shifted, is changed and is bended. I hope so. So to start off tonight's event, Afa Weaver. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for setting this up and inviting me. And I thought I would uh, read some of my attempts at more strict formalism. And it's from an older book of mine, Timber and Prayer, that came out in 1995. And um, I think I'll read uh, Bootleg Whiskey for 25 cents. And uh, this is this consists of two octets and a uh, concluding couplet, and they're rhyming in some sort some sort of way. Bootleg whiskey for twenty five cents for J T Stewart. They lap up their liquor with virtuosity. The stiff imports from Macon, Georgia, the velvet brand from Memphis, Tennessee, the West Indian cool from Florida. They sway together upstairs at Jackie's. They listen to Duke on the radio, Codas coddle the heads on necks of putty that taste jazz with home brew and sodas. Their new shoes are from downtown with Italy stamped inside. And their dresses came to them from full closets where a frown from wealth shines down. The city confesses to ballrooms where corn liquor is thrown down like New York water. A few undress, love, they can't do better or worse. The gown of gaiety envelops them, possesses. They debate the undebatable. They drift away in Jackie's back room in syncopated sway. And I should add that this is an ekphrastic um, piece here. This is the last section of the book and several of the uh, poems here are written to paintings by Jacob Lawrence. Um, it also is a kind of homage or homage, I should say, to jazz. And um, there's a piece here for uh, Sidney Boucher. And this consists of uh, quatrains. There are four of them, the concluding couplet with end rhyme. Sidney Boucher. No one could ever call the way Boucher did. He squeezed that soprano sax so that a vision from our own lax recollections poured forth in a display. We all tried to call back then. We summoned like meisters, the private moments curled up inside ultimate forgotten corners of us, tucked, hidden. While Bubba Miley cut him, Bechet would step backstage to drink. He yelled out who he was gonna to think to call next, what soul, what whim. The people sitting at their tables didn't know that he was a conjurer. He told tales by making morals stir with messages that hung like a jazz fable. We were in our own dimension as we made a deliberate suspension. So 
And um, there is a piece, um, and and this is the third poem I'll read. I think I have time for this one. This is a little bit longer. And this was when I decided to play around with tetrameter. And it's um, written to a piece by Duke Ellington entitled Blues in Orbit. I wrote a lot of these poems in uh, 1989, I think, and I was adjuncting in New York. And I'd get up early in the morning and I had a Walkman. That was state of the art to those times, in those times. And I listened to Duke Ellington. And uh, I read W. William Butler Yeats and listened to Duke Ellington. Anyway, this is Blues in Orbit. And it's dedicated to Amiri Baraka. Buster from dollars to pennies, broke beyond broke. He moved his keys in his pocket to get the sound of metal as it jangled around. He awoke just five minutes before his stop, his penance about to begin. He looked at his base in his case, hooked safely inside. Something tore away deep in his flesh, an old sore reopened. He swallowed and pulled back from the hallowed pit of regret almost remembered how his father ranted, counters slammed the door in his young face. He forgot his usual grace and said, an AME minister should have a doctor for his son better than some junkie musician. Hell there, he remembered the fustian stance of his preacher father as a train pulled him closer to home and finally to the platform. He thought he saw her form for a minute, then he recalled she would never be called a bitch in public he found a cabbie, an old friend who was unlucky, too, but willing to drive him home with the meter off like in Rome. Then one night, he lost his wallet and got into a cab, his jacket stinking of wine and fell asleep. He woke to find himself in a heap on his own bed, the driver having pitied another musician. Then he was home. The physician of his father's dreams would likely have flown in and driven a caddy. His wife started in on him right away drove him into the dim lit chair by the open window. He could see the yellow glow of the bar sign in the night air. He caught the mischievous stare of a pretty woman, fresh and young, who stepped from the bar where she hung out with failed saxophonists and pianists who never made the list. His wife beat on made him wince as he screamed high and grim from the kitchen. He wondered when it was that she ever lured him into loving her how he could account for the way she stood now, robbed of any semblance of beauty. He wished the parlance of young bodies fever with desire would come back, but the only fire was in his base case with the shape that mocked a woman. Her nape fell back against him as he walked up behind her and she allowed him to embrace her, run his fingers up and down her belly. That night they ate quietly and in bed he moved to slowly undo her gown. She scolded him like an irritated snake folded up for its retreat from a beat life. He rolled over and felt his life like a dollar rumpled until you can't see the designs that fill it with meaningfulness. No one you know will accept it. No hard won victories anymore, only the struggling. The next day she rode with him to the station set, stayed and prim, only to go on and on about the bills accumulating a pout. He got onto the train after a stiff peck on the cheek. He left her again, followed his base case until it sat comfortably in the place beside him. He tried to feel good again, forget the idea of home. So I think that's all I have time for. It's at eight minutes, right? Thank you so much. I like. I like that ending about home. Uh, I like to think of poetry as a kind of home. So um, I like that. I like that as an ending. Uh, and maybe and maybe for m many people, music is a kind of home too, a kind of music you listen to that uh, reminds you of wherever home is for you. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of people have some music they work to and some music they listen to at home and Whatever that home music is, is their real thing, their real thing. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, I think we're going to listen next to some poetry by Victoria Chang. And then we will be back for a conversation with, with both, both of these poets. 
So Victoria has also uh, done a lot uh, walking with form and on the edges of form. And, uh, and you, you, you'll get to hear what Victoria does when she's thinking about form as well. So please welcome Victoria Chen. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. And thanks, Red Hen Press and um, everyone who helped plan this event. Um, I'll just read a, a couple poems and maybe I'll start. Um, I'll read poems from my book, um, Obit. And uh, they are little poems shaped like um, obituaries. And uh, I will actually start with a poem called Music because you are all talking about music. Music died on August 7th, 2015. I made a video with old pictures and music for the funeral. I picked Hallelujah in acapella because they weren't really singing, but actually crying. When my children came into the room, I pretended I was writing. Instead, I looked at my mother's old photos, the fabric patterns on all her shirts, the way she held her hands together at the front of her body. In each picture, the small brown purse that now sits under my desk. At the funeral, my brother-in-law kept turning the music down. When he wasn't looking, I turned the music up because I wanted these people to feel what I felt. When I wasn't looking, he turned it down again. At the end of the day, someone took the monitor and speakers away, but the music was still there. This was my first understanding of grief. This one's called My Mother's Teeth. My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease, once again on August 3rd, 2015. The fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words around my mouth like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. Um, so I wrote about 70 of those uh, little obituaries, and then I stopped and, and I started writing um, formal poems, so Sistinas, Villanelles, and Triolets, all sorts of forms. They were all terrible poems, and um, but I did write a few Tankas, which are uh, uh, syllabic poems, 57577, 31 lines, and um, a friend of mine said that those should stay in the manuscript because they were toward, like written toward children or my children, but children in general. So I um, I spread them all out over the manuscript. So I'll just read a, a few, four total. There, there are two on each page, sort of antiphonally, maybe talking to each other. I tell my children that hope is like a blue skirt. It can twirl and twirl, that men like to open it, take it apart and wound it. I tell my children that sometimes I too can hope, that sometimes nothing moves, but my love for someone and the light from the dead star. I'll read two more. Do you see the tree? Its secrets grow as lemons. Sometimes I pretend I love my children more than words. No one knows this but words. My children, children, today my hands are dreaming as they touch your hair. Your hair turns into winter. When I die, your hair will snow. Um, so I will read maybe, uh, looking at my time, I will read uh, maybe another obituary and then I'll read like a couple new poems. 
This one is called The Clock. The clock died on June 24th, 2009, and it was untimely. How many times my father has failed the clock test? Once I heard a scientist with Alzheimer's on the radio trying to figure out why he could no longer draw a clock. It had to do with the superposition of three types, the hours represented by one to 12, the minutes where one no longer represents one but five, and a two now represents 10, then the second hand that measures one to 60. I sat at the stoplight and thought of the clock, its perfect circle and its superpositions, all the layers of complication on a plane of thought. Yet the healthy read the clock in one single instant without a second thought. I think about my father and his lack of first thoughts, how every thought is a second or third or fourth thought, unable to locate the first most important thought. I wonder about the man on the radio and how far his brain has degenerated since. Marvel at how far our brains allow language to wander without looking back, but knowing where the peer is. If you unfold an origami swan and flatten the paper, is the paper sad because it has seen the shape of the swan or does it aspire toward flatness, a life without creases? My father is the paper. He remembers the swan, but can't name it. He no longer knows the paper swan represents an animal swan. His brain is the water the animal swan once swam in, holds everything. But when thawed, all the fish disappear. Most of the words we have, most of the words we say have something to do with fish. And when they're gone, they're gone. So I'll read two. Um, tiny little short new poems from a manuscript called The Trees Witness Everything. And these are, and the reason I'm reading these is just because they're also in uh, syllabics and they're in various syllabics. So um, they're varying from all, like, I don't know, four lines. Actually, they're varying from three lines to nine lines and they're just in different, different forms. And so um, this one is called, Foghorn. And they're also um, after W.S. Merwin's titles. So I use his titles as a way of formally formal constraint as well. Foghorn. Sometimes the language we have is inadequate. On rainy days, people leave yellow boots on the porch. The egret takes off its yellow feet and steals the boots. And this will be the last poem I read, and it's also a very tiny poem. It's called The Notes. I stay in bed and listen for any music. Today is cheerful. It has overshot itself and is tomorrow. I'm left behind, waiting for the birds to return. They've moved on. I now know that being birdless doesn't hurt. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I I actually, I, I have an aviary in my backyard. I don't know if you knew that, Victoria. So um, I, I've had that there forever and also have had chickens. So I can't imagine my own life being birdless, but <laughs> I'll, I'll think about it. I'll think. About it. Um, so I wanted to start off by asking, uh, both of you have done some teaching. I think you are currently teaching, Victoria. I don't know if you are currently teaching at all, Afa, but um, I know that you, you've you both taught uh, poets and, and mentored poets at different times. And so I thought I'd start off by asking a kind of teacherly question that, that does come to me. Um, I, and, and let me say that when I was um, a student myself, at, um, my teachers were much more directive than I am with my students. Um, they would say to me things like, Kate, you're going to do this. Um, I tend to make a little more suggestions with my students. But um, if a student came to you and said to you, you know, I'm just going to write free verse. I'm never going to write in form. It's too hard to write sonnets and villanelles and all that bit. Uh, I'm just going to write just free verse. It just feels easier to me. Um, I'm just curious what, what each of you would say. Maybe, maybe Afa, you could start off with uh, 
the, the free verse lover who doesn't want to write in form because it's just too difficult, what would you say? Uh, what would I say or what did I say? Well, what did you say? Let's, let's, let's get what did you say. Well, when I started teaching, I used a model from Michael Harper. So uh, they had to write blank verse. You know, the, the first assignment was to at least try the iambic, the five beat line. And I would assign forms. So in a 16 week semester, they might have 10 forms. Mm. Um, and I said, do your best. If you can't complete it, that's fine. But I'd also tell them, I'd, I'd say, um, you know, I spent some time in the world of visual arts in my third marriage, quite a bit of time. And I would tell them that I said, a good painter is also a good drafts person. You know, even if you do abstractions, you should be able to draw, you know, to some extent. And I said, well, whether you follow the rules or not, um, understand also that nothing is free. <laughs> nothing is free. And if the poem works on, its, on the page, it works because it has some kind of organization, however subtle that might appear to be. Um, I was, that, that's what I did say to them you know, mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. So you wanted them to at least try um, to, to understand structure inside a poem. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would say to them as time went on, I would say, you know, hip hop and rap have form. They're not free. Mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. not, they're, they're definite forms. And as at least one person has argued, Adam Bradley, I believe is Adam's last name, in his book of rhymes, hip hop is basically early accentual syllabic verse. It's, you know, the fact that hip hop is ruled by the beat, the percussive aspect of hip hop is exactly what, um, how we get to the evolution of the accentual verse in English. And he goes back to old English and he says, they're doing the same thing. You know, so, and that's what I would say uh, as time went on, I began to say that as well, because they love to go to that place. I said, well, right. fine, you know. Right. You go into a very formalist structure, whether you know it or not. Right, right. Yeah. No, I like I like what you're saying. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite poets um uh, is Evie Shockley. I'm sure you've both read her. And um and you know, I've had a lot of poets tell me that her poems are quote, as they will say, all over the page. Um, uh, but I see so much structure and in in her work, so much very careful structure in her work. Um, so Victoria, what would you say to the to the, the, the would-be free verser? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I would echo what um, Afa said as well. I think that, you know, English is uh, very, you know, essential syllabic. It's very, um, you know, if, if you listen to us talking, it's very accented. And so I think there's rhythms, you know, just even kind of talking, you can feel the rhythms as we're talking. I think that that even free verse is very scannable, right? And so I think that people don't realize that there are patterns in everything that they're writing and even in their speech on a daily basis. Um, and so I think that that that's a good place to, to start. Um, in terms of pedagogy, I guess I would also probably bring in poems that are, are contemporary poems. Um, in new forms. I just taught a class on the duplex and um, by Jericho Brown. And so I think uh, there's, you know, there's cool there. I mean, the bop and, um, you know, the, 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 the guzzle or the huzzle, however you want to pronounce it. There are some really neat new forms that, that, um, you know, more contemporary poets have tried. So you don't have to necessarily start with uh, you know, the sonnet or something like that. I mean, you could mm -hmm. start with something that maybe some forms I think feel a little more contemporary. And so mm -hmm. I think you can start there and bring in poems that are um, a little more con contemporary that, um, you know, Patricia Smith has written some poems and and I think you can enter poetry that way, formalism that way. And, and, and I think, uh, I think people are, are pretty amenable. Like I've never had a student actually say, oh, I'm not gonna write X, Y, or Z. But I think the sonnet is probably not that appealing sometimes. Um, and I think that, 
sometimes like uh, the Sistinas or Villanelles are not super fun. I love the Sistina, but I think if you just give them some guidance and some examples and show them some examples that might feel relevant to them and then give them some guidance on how to actually write them because it's writing formal poems can be a little bit mathematical, you know, so you just mm -hmm. have to like a Sistina, just pick the words. So the words are really important, you know, then you might read like a Bishop poem or and then you just look at the words and just take them step by step along the way, you know, with the guzzle as well. It's like you just take them along the way and show them one step at a time. And I think when you peel it that way, you know, I think it's easier to enter form. In fact, I think form is sometimes easier to write than in a free verse poem because you have some, I always call it like, like, you know, when you're bowling, you have some of those, those, uh, I don't know what they're called, but the things that keep the gutter out of play, those rails or whatever. And so I think it can actually be easier to write some formal poems because you're not, there's like not so much blank space that you're overwhelmed. So that's sort of maybe some things that I would do or say. I knew there was something I was doing wrong with bowling, but I think it was keeping the ball in the lanes. <laughs> That's right. You just got you yeah. put those things up, and it's all good. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I wanted to ask you guys another question about this, um, and and this goes back to the whole idea of sort of what what forms we might work with, but. I, I see I see a lot of poets working with just kind of creating their own sort of forms and structures. And a lot of my students will play with, you know, in other words, I'm gonna do three, five, three, five, three, five, and kind of create a form so that it looks very structured on the page, but it isn't necessarily a particular form, but they're working in very tightly formed stanzas or often couplets. Um, I mean, couplets have become, I, I see more and more of that with, with student uh, students that I'm working with. And so they are structuring it. It's just not a form like as, as we're talking about the sonnet. Um, do you feel that that's just as valid in terms of, of working in form to sort of be inventing forms as you're working with them? I'll start with you this time, Victoria. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I think, I think forms and inventing new forms is a, is political. It's a form of subversion. So I think that, that, uh, you know, I think, I think, for example, Jericho's invention of the duplex is a response to our current times, you know, and I think that people reinventing the sonnet or even breaking the rules of existing forms or modifying existing forms to use um, them in different ways. If you look out throughout history, it's been done as well. I mean, in uh, St. Vincent Millay wrote a wrote sonnets at a time when they were very unpopular and the subject matter is very feminist. For example, Shakespearean sonnets are are completely um, different than than the sonnets that had been written in the past, and so I think I think people are always evolving, and so I absolutely think that you know, it, and it, it's very I think it's all political. You know, I think mm -hmm. that people um, writing in different ways or writing on subject matter in different ways, using forms in different ways, inventing new forms to me is absolutely a response to the current environment that we're in, and I think it keeps um, poetry relevant and um, modern, and that's arguably why it still exists is because it hasn't stayed the same. So I think it's absolutely necessary to to change things. Afa, what would you say about that? Students sort of inventing their own forms, maybe the way music kept, keeps getting reinvented. Well, I, I would say, Kate, uh, that um, when I invented the Bach uh, 20, 25 years ago, it was 1997 when I was teaching at Cave Canon. And um, I invented the form uh, because I wanted to give them an exercise in how a poem progresses from the very first line to the end. And so I created that uh, form, which is actually based on the golden mean, the one third, two thirds relationship. And um, my students were Evie Shockley, Terrence Hayes, you know, um, Yona Harvey, um, uh, Honoré Jeffers, those are my students. You know? And so, um, but that, 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 the Bach was the first form to come out of Kabi Khan. And I did that because 
We were in a place at that time, 1997. That was the second year. And um, we were in a place in the, the literary history of this country that was all new because there had never been a place, a place for black poets. And um, it was a very, very emotional time for us. And it was a time where we were just overwhelmed by our own responses to having something like that. So I thought it was really important for me to create something out of that ethos. You know? um, I think um, Arnold Rampersad in his introduction to his Oxford anthology made note of the fact that African-American poets always struggle with English because English is a language of oppression. And um, when the Africans were brought here, some of them were fluent in Arabic. They could read and write Arabic as well as the other languages in Western or across, across Africa. So all of that went into English with a kind of resistance. And so I wanted to um, do something in terms of creating a form that would bear the DNA of the African-American struggle in poetry. And um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar is probably our most uh, painful example of having to do that, to move between the imposition of plantation poetry as when I say imposition, he was required to do that in order to have a career and how much he hated that. And so the vernacular has always been a very touchy and uh, difficult and complex place for African-American poets. Our relationship to the vernacular is in some ways our relationship to ourselves, understanding that we all come from different places in the class structure inside African-American culture. And so that's why I decided I would create something called the bop. People have thought that it was bebop, but it wasn't. Bop refers to the way you walk down the street in urban environments, at least in my generation. And it also um, sort of supported the idea of movement through the poem. And uh, when I was very young, I was a wannabe photographer, but I'm colorblind, so I can't compose according to color. And so I composed geometrically. And so I became fascinated when I was very young with the golden mean. And so I imported that fascination of, of my younger days into the time when I created the bop. So as, you know, as uh, Barack has just, Victoria, I'm sorry, Victoria has just said, it's, an, it's a political act, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the bop, I, um, the bop establishes the second year of the retreat, but it also establishes um, a kind of, um, way of being in Kavi Ken, which is about um, creating from oneself, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to acculturation or, you know, making amends and, you know, giving away yourself in order to be accepted. So that, and that goes on. There's no real resolution to that that I can see right now, but at least there's a place to begin where we don't have to suffer the way Paul Lawrence Dunbar suffered. You know, or we don't have to be blocked the way Langston Hughes was blocked. His whole career, he was blocked. And so that's what, and the bop is a form, you know, it's a, it's a form based on the number three. It's a form that unifies the lyric expression, music with the lyric expression and poetry or tries to, you know, it matches narrative with lyric and so on. But um, yeah, so it's a, it was a political act. Mm -hmm. I and like Jericho, that. Jericho's a second generation mm -hmm. of Kavi Khan. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Kavi Khan started in 95 or 96? 96. 96. 96 was the first retreat and uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Alexander and I were the guest poets. Mm. That first year, Cornelius Eady and Toy Derricott did all the teaching, and they realized that it was just too much for just the two of them. And then they called Elizabeth and myself to be first faculty. Mm. So Elizabeth and I were first faculty in 1997, um, 24 years ago. Mm. 
Yeah, I keep, I, I wonder, uh, so Douglas Kearney and Camille Dungy, who, uh, both of them who Red Hen has published, I wonder when they went there, but I think it was in the early years, because um, I think it was a transformative experience for them going to Kavi Yeah, um, they came a little later, um, because I think um, Terrence and those folks, uh, and Evie, are a little older then. Right, I think so, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, can't tell a lady's age, so I won't speculate on Evie's age. So don't ask me. That. <laughs> she's older than Doug. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, Evie's Evie's such an amazing writer. Um, so um, when you uh, Victoria, when you think of of form poets that you come back to and that you do read, um, can you tell us a little bit? Are there are there any? poets in, in any form at all that you feel you come back to? Hmm. I mean, there's so many. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there are so many in the few that, that I mentioned. I mean, I love, obviously, I love the Bishop formal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. poems, uh, the Sistina, you know, Sistina. And mm -hmm. then um, you know, the, the Villanelle that she wrote, One Art, is obviously something that is fun to read. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think I just, you know, I don't really think of, of formal poets, um, so much as I, re I think of formal poems that I like to kind of revisit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I'll sometimes look at Aga Shahid Ali's guzzles. Um, and I like reading sonnets. I mean, mm -hmm. I read somewhere that in Bob Robert Haas's new book of Little Book of Forms, that the sonnet, uh, I think that Peter Sachs said the sonnet is uh, resembles the, sh the sort of dimensions or the proportions of a human face, and I thought that was really interesting. And so, looking at a sonnet or reading a sonnet is sort of looking at the the, the beloved in some ways. I've been thinking about that lately. Um, I have been thinking a lot about. Uh, Doug Kearney's poems, because I think we're, uh, uh, a friend of mine and I are going to write a review of his latest book, Show. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, the form, the formal aspects of, of his work. And he said something interesting that I've been thinking about too, about refrains, you know, which is another kind of form and how that's, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's an, uh, it's an, um, it's a it's an interesting word that is called an ant antagonism, because it is both uh, it is both itself and its opposite. So refrain means to um, do again and also to stop in the same way that like cleave is also an antagonism. And so I don't know I've just been thinking a lot about the forms within those kinds of poems. You know the the Doug Kearney poems and um, yeah I mean I think uh, I've looked at the bots recently and. Um, the golden shovel. So yeah, I've been reading a lot of and just thinking a lot about form because I think form is very important to me in my poetics without uh, consciously thinking about it. And Terrence Hayes, you know, uh, uh, something I quote all the time, he says that form for him is like uh, being like a bird flying freely within a cage. Mm -hmm. And um, Robert Creeley said something too, uh, strong feelings, um, require strong containers. And so I've just been thinking a lot about form and and why I feel so free within formal constraints. And so I've been reading a lot of formal poems. It's just sort of naturally, and lots of other poems too, obviously, I, I like reading all the time. So yeah, that's just a really long winded, winding, winding answer to your question. <laughs> no, I, I like to think about that. Um, you know, from, from a publisher's point of view, how, how, how the, how the poem is structured as well. Um, so Afa, what, what do you think about when you think of, of poets you like to read? I'm just gonna close my door. Oh, okay. Well, um, <laughs> of course, Gwendolyn Brooks, and I say of course, because I just loved her voice, you know? There are poems of hers that I really like. Um, especially the ones she wrote, she explained to me, she and her husband lived in an apartment building in Chicago with the long uh, shotgun hallways. 
And, um, you know, those poems there, those sonnets, the sonnets of the poor, are just mm -hmm. delightful. And um, My Papa's Waltz, that poem, I like very much. And uh, of course, it's kind of hard to beat Bishop Sestina, the one about the stove. That's really hard, the marble stove. That's a hard one to beat. Not that you want to beat, you know, <laughs> overcome it, but it's really beautiful. And, um, you know, Jericho Brown made it a point when his book was published, traditionally told me, he said, there's a bop in there. It's called Dear Whiteness inside his book tradition. So, and Larry Van Cliff Stefanon, I, you know, she, I enjoy her work as well. And I don't want to name too many names of the living because, you know, someone will call, you didn't say my name. I said, oh, <laughs> I got your name. But um, yeah, of course. And then Dylan Thomas, you know, do not go gentle into that good night. There are many. And, um, Coming back to Yeats, you know, Among School Children is one of my favorite poems of his, you know. The smiling public man, 60 years old, goes into an elementary school. Who can tell the dancer from the dance? I think that's just gorgeous, that line. Um, yeah, so, and I, I, I love it when uh, something sounds. Uh, Robert Pinsky's poem, The Shirt, is just delicious. Mm -hmm. It was just delicious, and it's so heartfelt, you know. Um, yeah, I, you know, I can. Um, Major Jackson has a poem in the poem a day. I think it was yesterday. That thought was just wonderful. I told her so. But it's like that, you know. <laughs> you know, it ranges. You know, for me, it ranges. And uh, yeah, when. You know, it's language is, is uh, language is our tool, you know, as poets. And it's our tool in a peculiar kind of way. And, uh, you know, it is, a, you know, English is stress. It's a stressed language, you know. And, and the time that I, you know, I started studying Mandarin when I was 50 years old. So I don't know how much of it actually sinks in, but to get used to a language where you don't, it, it's more the pitch than the volume. The stress is not the same, you know, as um, as as um, I've come to understand. But the sound of it is just so gorgeous. It is really gorgeous. Um, but that's it, you know. You admire the way musicians arrange sound. And my friend, the late uh, Harold Anderson, he was he was a bass player. And uh, before he passed away, he said, you know, I'm really just looking at pure sound, you know. That was his tool. And uh, language is like that. I mean, sometimes I listen to myself talk and I try to hear in a kind of you know, observant way what I'm seeing and how my stresses are being formed. And I think that comes from studying Mandarin as I got older. My teacher told me to get a tape recorder and record my, and start to be able to self-criticize my, my the way I was speaking. So I listened to myself speak so I can hear the mistakes in tone and so on. And I think that has helped me to just sort of step back and hear myself speaking English. Mm -hmm. So, And sometimes I play with my students and I say, well, instead of, instead of saying English, try saying English <laughs> or shift the, um, shift the stress around and play with it when you're writing or when you're thinking, you know. Uh, so uh, instead of say, instead of saying satire, say satire. And how does that sound? You know, you can hear yourself moving towards satirical when you pronounce it that way. So yeah, you have to stop me. I'll get lost in language. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, it's funny. So you know, I know you have studied Chinese for many years, um, and I think of poetry. Uh, itself as almost another language, just as music is 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 kind of another language. Um, when my kids were growing up, I wanted them to learn to read music and and play music because it would be like having another language running in their heads. And um, 
I do think that that when you can speak another language, it broadens out the way you think in the world. And and I know how hard you've you've worked Afa to to learn Chinese, um, which uh, certainly cannot be an easy language. Um, my son has spent the last four years learning Vietnamese, which also again not an easy language. I only worked on Spanish and French, which are far easier than Chinese and Vietnamese. Um, but getting back to poetry, I, I think I had lunch the other day with someone who was asking me, he was kind of thinking of being on the red hand board and he was trying to figure out why we publish poetry as, as business people often do. And why is it? He said, why, how many of these books sell? And, um, so we were trying to explain the importance of poetry. And he said, how can you even tell when something's a poem? And I immediately was just like, you can tell as soon as you hear it. And he said, really, what is it that you hear? And I said, you can hear it and you can hear the music in the language, you hear it. It's, it's just, as soon as Garrison Keillor is reading it, you know immediately that's poetry. And he said, do you? And I said, absolutely. Um, and I, he could see me getting very excited at lunchtime. Mark was saying, settle down, Kate, um, <laughs> um, as I do get excited about poetry. But I, I'm curious whether you, you both would have given a better explanation to, to that uh, idea that um, we know poetry when we hear it. Uh, when we hear that musicality of language, I feel like that's the first uh, elixir of awakening that we know we're in the presence of poetry. Victoria? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think everything can be a poem in some ways, too. I think that, I mean, poetry to me is, is uh, kind of, a, it's just, it's, it's not just music for me, but it is very much so about language. So um, there's musicality in language, but there there's also something, I, uh, you know, images are very important to me as a, as a poet. Um, but yeah, sound, imagery, um, you know, the rhythms related to sound. And, and I think that poetry also can make one feel things that nothing else can really make one feel. So um, it just sort of, it seems like one of our more philosophical arts and, and uh, you know, and obviously I think there's, there can be a, a sense of tension and compression that you don't find in prose writing as, as like a book. You might find it within a passage of language, but, it's a short form, usually poetry. So I think that is kind of special. Um, but yeah, I mean, to make an argument, I, I think it's even. I don't. I don't really feel like I need to make an argument for poetry. So I would just push. Like if he kind of started arguing, I'd push back on him and and just say, the fact that it's sort of anti-capitalist should be the thing that we support. You know, because yeah. <laughs> everything yeah. else is so capitalist. And so I don't feel like I need to justify this this art form that's been around since the beginning of time. And uh, that's, that's sort of how I respond, I guess. Yeah. I like that. I, I'm going to remember that, that mm -hmm. uh, it's an art form that's been around from the beginning of time and that it's anti-capitalist. I like both of those arguments very much. Afa, what would you say? I would say it takes your uh, attention away from everything else except the poem and it pulls you in and you forget what's around you and you hear only what the poem tells you and you're suspended in time and space and uh, you feel like something inside you has changed when you read the poem and something inside you wants to change, you know? And um, I'm thinking of The Day Lady Died by Frank O'Hara. That's just uh, one of my favorite poems. But it's, it's that I would say. And um, I would say also that I would tell a businessman, and I'm just joking, but if you don't do what you feel like you could do, then the muses will send a thousand million butterflies to haunt you at night. And it came from a poem that you did not read. <laughs> mm. 
you know, that's what I would say. Poetry has that power. But uh, yeah, absolutely. And you could also say, oh, just think about all the poor poets who never got published in, throughout the whole time just in this country, you know? Just think about that and what one little gesture would do for all of them. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I like to think of that electrifying elegance on the page and, and what it feels like when you hear someone read a poem out loud and you fear feel that electricity in the air. And, um, and, and, and as you said, Afa, you, you can, you, you feel those butterflies and um, that, that movement of energy um, because that's what poetry does. It moves us and awakens us and changes our lives. Um, hopefully uh, in, in great and glorious ways. And, and I think that the, the poet who read at the inauguration was a great example of that, um, of lifting our lives in a particular way um, and, and um, making us want to be our best selves. Um, well, right. it's been such an honor to, to speak with both of you today. I feel like I haven't seen both of you for so long. In normal times, I would have seen both of you in the last year. I would have seen you on the East Coast, Afa, and I would have seen you, Victoria, somewhere uh, in person here uh, in on somewhere in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. I missed both of you so much. So mm -hmm. it's wonderful to see you um, and to know that you are writing poetry, thinking about poetry and and living in this in this world of poetry. I hope that uh, you're both well. And thank you so much for being willing to join us and Red Hen in this amazing conversation today. Uh, we appreciate it so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. It was good to see both of you. Thanks. And um, my wife and I were doubly vaccinated. We're doubly, we're fully immunized as of today. So excellent, excellent. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations well, so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can you can uh, now at some point uh, celebrate and however you however you like to celebrate and uh, um, that would be great. And I hope I will see you next time I'm on the East Coast, Afa. Sounds good. Okay, excellent. And Victoria, I hope to see you uh, sometime soon as well. Sounds good. Was a pleasure. Both of you take care. Well, thank you, you so much. Okay. All right. Bye bye. 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 All right. Thank you all so, Thank much. You so much. Good to see you. Um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have so many more incredible events coming up over the next few months. We're taking a break next week, but you can join us again on May 12th for our next Hen House at Home event featuring Janice Dewey, Eleanor Wilner, and Barbara Allen, uh, two of them being the founders, both of them except for Eleanor, being the co-founders of Red Hen's newest imprint, Crooked Hearts Press. So we'll see you May 12th at 4 p.m. Pacific. I hope you have a good night and happy reading.